Halloween is one of my favorite holidays. Before anyone goes thinking this video is about destroying the joy of spooky season or pardon the parlance of internet trolls race baiting, you've got it confused. I just want to do a deep dive on my favorite holiday and how it's intersected with the racial and class realities of my ancestors. Basically, I'm going to explore how black Americans have celebrated Halloween, the deeper meanings of supernatural folklore, and how black Americans have at times been impacted by white American celebrations of Halloween. What kind of ghost stories did the enslaved tell? What's the perfect way to throw a 1920s Halloween party in Harlem? Was Devil's Night in Detroit just about hooligan shenanigans or something deeper? While a wealth of black Halloween experiences are lost to the ravages of time, it was fun combing through history to find folklore, trivia, and stories for this video. Along the way, maybe I'll spark some nostalgia and make you recall your favorite Halloween memory. So grab your favorite candy or sweet treat, it better not be candy corn, relax, and enjoy a black people's history of Halloween. From Dia de los Muertos in Mexico to Egungun festivals in Nigerian Yoruba culture, honoring and celebrating your ancestors and the dead has been a worldwide practice for centuries. Halloween as we know it in America has roots in both Christianity's All Hallows Eve and a Celtic pagan festival called Samhain. But what about a central component of Halloween, the ghost? Like all pre-modern cultures, various pre-colonial African groups had supernatural beings, ancestral spirits, and deities. These beliefs were brought with the enslaved over to America where they fused with Anglo-Saxon and Celtic beliefs in ghosts. Ghosts and demons were long established in Anglo culture as being real, thanks to official recognition by the Catholic Church. Even after the emergence of Protestantism and a rejection of many Catholic convictions, the belief in ghosts remained among many. Enslaved people swapped hank tales, folklore stories involving ancestors and ghosts restlessly remaining among the living, sometimes dabbling in harmless tricks and and sometimes much worse, often referred to as hants or haints depending on dialect. As explored by Elliot Gorn's study of black enslaved folklore, we can learn a lot about how the enslaved viewed themselves and others through the stories they told. Some enslaved claimed that a master's ghost could whip his enslaved ghosts in the afterlife, making them want to be buried far from their masters. This demonstrates the real fear black people had over their master's absolute control over their bodily autonomy, so much so that they believed that they might never be free from bondage, even in the afterlife. One man named Jacob Aldrich claimed that his strict owner, a sugar planter, returned each night after his death to run the sugar mill. A woman named Sarah Douglas from Alabama Emma said her mistress was very strict, saying after she died we were so glad we had a big dance in Mrs. Kitchen and old miss came back and slapped one of the slaves and left the print of her hand on her face. That white hand never did go away and that place was forever haunted after that. Other hants were believed to return to give aid and advice, rectify wrongs, take revenge, protect kin, complete unfinished tasks, or comfort the sick and lonely. This type of folklore shows that despite the commonality of enslaved people being sold and kidnapped away from their families, often parted for life, they found a way to reaffirm deep kinship ties. Despite the alienation and isolation of slavery, through hant tales, they continued pre-slavery beliefs in ancestors visiting and watching over loved ones. They still felt a connection to each other and to home, despite chattel slavery's cruel destruction of our various cultural identities. Another theme in hant tales were that of murdered enslaved people who often became avengers in the afterlife, rumored to kill former masters or racists who were especially worse than others. Among Gullah Geechee enslaved people among the South Carolina coast, it was believed that ghosts brought misfortune to those with whom they lived in conflict. For the enslaved who were allowed to mourn their fallen family and friends, it wasn't uncommon for rituals or hoodoo with roots in West African cultures to occur. Many were noted to leave items their loved ones might need in the spirit world on burials. Common items were broken cups, saucers, mirrors, bottles, clocks, and seashells. Sometimes mourning doubled as hoodoo to keep paints away because they weren't all avengers who cared about white masters and wrongdoers. Some were equal opportunist hands. So some enslaved 
slave placed the last item touched by the deceased at the graves, killed a white chicken at the graveside, wore the color white to symbolize the spirit world, or created bottle trees to keep evil spirits away. Since ancient times, people in various locations in Africa believed that spirits could live in glass bottles. So by hanging bottles on trees, evil spirits could become stuck in them in the evening and be destroyed by sunlight in the morning. As for the Gullah Geechee in the South Carolina Low Country, one of the most powerful form of defenses against haints is the color blue, cultivated from the ancient indigo plant. In pre-modern times, indigo was so valuable and difficult to grow and turn into blue dye that it was nicknamed blue gold. When white people colonized America, they found that it flourished in the subtropical lands of South Carolina. It would become a staple of the slave trade by the mid-18th century. The enslaved would mix leftover remnants from indigo vats with lime, milk, and other substances for a shade that has come to be known as haint blue. The enslaved, and later their descendants, would put the color on entry points, doors, window sills, porch ceilings, as a form of defense against wandering haints, who were believed to be confused into thinking the blue was water, which they could not cross. The tradition continues today, though often devoid of the cultural context. Haint blue comes in a variety of shades. So the belief in ghosts was common among black Americans even after slavery. A common misconception I want to address is that KKK members did night rides in their white robe costumes to scare black people. Yes, KKK members dressed as ghosts of dead confederates, but it's doubtful that these men in white sheets were actually seen as ghosts. The legitimate fear black people had of them was likely not that they were haints, but instead the fear came from the very real rapes, assaults, threats, and murders done by Klansmen during the nadir of American race relations. The 1920s, for the first time for many Americans, was a decade of utter consumerism and leisure when compared to the centuries before. Halloween had become popularized in the late 19th century thanks to Irish American immigrants, but by the 1920s it was thriving as a nationwide holiday. Among the black elite in New York, Halloween celebrations were common and even extravagant affairs. A 1925 article detailed how members of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity and Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority both threw brilliant Halloween parties. Over 400 people attended each party and at one, a black alpha wore a Ku Klux Klan costume? Okay. I know they were like, so... So we really doing this? Nigga, go home. In 1926, Harlem's well-known The Savoy Ballroom was founded. It was notable for being one of the big clubs with a clientele that was mostly black and not just considered interracial because of the performers on stage. <coughs> the Cotton Club. In October, shortly after opening, they ran an ad in the New York Amsterdam News for their bewitching Halloween party at the Savoy, appealing to those who wanted to go back to childhood. Let your memory take you back to the days when you got together with the bunch in soaked windows, hooted like owls, moaned like a witch, and you awaken the neighbors with blood-curdling catcalls. Decorated from top to bottom, the Savoy will reveal an enchanting atmosphere of the days of witchcraft, the ad said. This shows how long black Americans had been dabbling in Halloween shenanigans if in the 20s adults were being wooed with nostalgia. Even the October 1920 issue of the short-lived Brownies Book for Children included Halloween poems and stories as an ongoing tradition among the community, wrote contributor Annette Christine Brown in a poem. We'll have on masks, of course, and wear the ugliest faces ever seen, and here and there and everywhere will spread the fun of Halloween. A 1927 article advised Halloween party throwers to have a supply of apples apples, donuts, apple cider, nuts, shelled and unshelled, figs, dates, and raisins. I love how candy wasn't mentioned and that six out of seven of these items would piss modern kids the fuck off. But of course, Halloween was not just a kid's holiday. It was for everyone. In the late 1800s, Halloween had begun to be associated with community shindigs more than pranks and arson. So Halloween parties for the whole family at the top of the century were common. The Halloween scene, as usual, afforded New Yorkers an opportunity to delight their friends with parties, bridge games, and dances wrote the New York Amsterdam News in 1931. Halloween party tradition survived through the years of the Great Depression and World War II, though it's worth noting that Halloween mischief included nihilistic rashes of vandalism and assaults disguised as pranks. But back to that in a moment. A 1953 Jet Pictorial showed black college students playing what appeared to be a very fun, and dare I say, sensual? 
game in which the goal was to keep an apple balanced between two foreheads. In an October 1963 spread of Ebony Magazine, the singer of The Twist, Chubby Checker, celebrated his birthday and Halloween by gushing over sweet potato pie, which he generously recreated for readers in the famous Ebony Test Kitchen. For years, Jet Magazine reported on an interracially mixed queer Halloween party in Chicago called Finney's Club Ball. In November 1964, they reported that over 3,000 people gathered at the club's 29th annual ball, which hosted 187 drag queens and 22 drag kings. For black Americans who didn't attend balls, parties, or dances, or go trick-or-treating, hallelujah parties and church gatherings on Halloween night were a common way for religious black people to seek refuge from demonic shenanigans, potential tricks, or acts of violence by gathering in church for prayer and activities. Because there was violence. boxer named Gypsy Joe Harris won 24 professional bouts in the 1960s with one blind eye. When the boxing world learned of his disability, his boxing license was revoked. It's worth mentioning because his eye was blinded on Halloween in 1957. He and his friends went out to snatch candy bags from other kids and one of the kids got so pissed he smashed a brick into Joe's eye. From this anecdote, we know that black children went trick-or-treating even amongst the racial violence of the mid-20th century and that snatching candy bags from other kids has been a long time tradition. Trick-or-treating had rose to prominence during the 30s, fallen off during the sugar rations of the war years, and rebounded again in the post-war baby boom. Whereas at the top of the century, it was more of a family and communal holiday. By the 50s, enveloped by the newly growing and defined teen culture, a night of unsupervised trick-or-treating became a rite of passage teen activity for many. When mixed with the racism of the civil rights era, it's no wonder that newspaper art archives about Halloween are peppered with stories of teen violence or stories that contain black people's worst fears. For instance, on Halloween 1957 in Pontotoc, Mississippi, two years after the brutal murder of Emmett Till, a 16-year-old named Jesse Harvey spent his last quarter on three Cokes and two apples before vanishing. Rumors at a local black barber shop spread that the boy had been seen being shoved into a car by two white men at gunpoint. Theories included that he had stumbled upon a bootlegger stash and been kidnapped or that he had been picked up by Halloween minded pranksters. Word quickly spread as the boy was reported missing by his mother. FBI agents arrived and began a manhunt. According to Jet Magazine, racist whites in the area told reporters, if this is another Till case, you ain't gonna find a body. We're a lot smarter. Less than a few weeks after the hubbub began, the 16-year-old Jesse walked off a bus into town and strolled into a drugstore to buy cigarettes, not knowing that people thought he had been abducted by Halloween revelers. It turns out, he had voluntarily left out of town to get work on a farm and hadn't told anybody he was leaving. Two years later in Corinth, Mississippi, another black boy wouldn't be so lucky. Eight white teenagers drove around the black part of town in a pickup truck, throwing firecrackers at black teens who were trick-or-treating. There are many anecdotes of white teens celebrating Halloween pranks during the Jim Crow era by driving to the part of town to cause havoc where people are powerless to stop them. When black trick-or-treaters threw rocks and bricks back at the eight white teens, they drove to someone's home for a shotgun and then drove back to the black area of town. They chose at random 15-year-old William Roy Prather, who was on his way home from cleaning up after a Halloween party at church with a friend. They murdered him in cold blood. Only one teen would serve time for the crime and it was less than one year total, despite being ordered to serve five years. The seven other accomplices to the murder were given probation. In addition to potential violent situations by racist pranksters on Halloween night, racist Halloween costumes have been a fixture of black children's experiences this entire time. From KKK costumes to Nazi costumes to blackface by everyone from politicians to Hollywood tastemakers to the costumes based on victims of police brutality, along with conservative religious beliefs, it's understandable why a small group of black Americans choose to not participate in the holiday at all. Detroit firefighters are bracing for Devil's Night. That's the annual pre-Halloween arson spree. Last year, 281 blazes were reported. City officials are taking steps to try and stop the fires. 
The night before October 31st has its own long history with various names, depending on who you ask. In 18th century Europe, it was called Mischief Night. Teens in New Jersey, parts of Pennsylvania, in New York, Delaware, Connecticut, and New Orleans still call it Mischief Night. Some people in New Jersey and New York call it Goosey Night. No matter what it was called, it was often a night of debauchery, arson, and vandalism, seemingly inspired by early Irish American traditions of Halloween night violence, arson, and vandalism. By the second half of the 20th century, neighborhoods and local organizations prepared for Mischief Night by offering activities that enticed children and teens with candy, costume contests, and dancing. Why store owners would stop selling eggs to children and teens in the last days of October, while adults in the 50s complained that Mischief Night had once been about fun, but was now too rowdy and violent. Mischief Night is an American tradition. For 50 years, it has been associated with soaped windows, scattered corn, and ringing doorbells, declared a Delaware newspaper in 1961. It continued, in the last few years, harmless pranks have been overshadowed by outright vandalism by older groups who run the riot before the Halloween. 1965 newspaper in Chester, Pennsylvania asked seven teens if Mischief Night should be discontinued, with five of them saying yes, citing destruction of property as the main reason. In segregated towns and cities, the bulk of the blame for Mischief Night shenanigans were usually placed on out-of-towners and minorities, reflecting both changing demographics and a rise in teen car culture. Teens in Michigan, especially the predominantly black Detroit, however, called it Devil's Night. Detroit had one of the biggest explosions of civil unrest in 1967, and it was due to a culmination of housing segregation, police brutality, and rising unemployment. With dozens of deaths and hundreds wounded among the raging fires, it served as a boogeyman for white people in the suburbs surrounding Detroit. Roughly 1,400 buildings were burned during the riot, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Detroit was on a massive decline in the 70s due to the oil crisis affecting its reliance on a single industry, automaking. 1975 article entitled, Goblin Proof Your House, How to Beat the Devil, in the Detroit Free Press, discussed how older children in the previous year's Devil's Night had used pellet guns and bricks. And by the time the 1980s were ushering in a recession, when many other cities were reporting less rowdy mischief nights, Devil's Night in Detroit was known for arson. In 1984 alone, 810 fires were reported between October 30th and November 1st. This this was due to an increased number of vacant structures, which included a higher proportion of single-family housing units compared with other major urban areas. Detroit is a sprawling city, and its roughly 139 square miles contributed to urban decay because there were thousands of empty buildings, and many of them were used to sell drugs. That brings up another interesting layer. Detroit residents were rumored to set fire to known trap houses, taking anti-drug enforcement into their own hands. But also, the increased media coverage in the years leading up to the hellish conditions of 1984 had brought in folks from out of town, many of them white, many of them possibly looking for a chance to blow off some steam in a neighborhood that wasn't theirs. The event suddenly became a spectacle, with fire buffs and enthusiasts trekking in from out of town, according to sensationalist news reports, to see Detroit burn. Said one fire photographer, it's real unusual to go to these fires in the ghetto and see 200 white guys taking pictures. It wasn't just white guys. A Tokyo-based production crew even showed up to capture shootings, stabbings, kids selling drugs on the street, a lot of violence. Wrote one sarcastic columnist in 1985, don't you just love it? No longer is Detroit known as a one industry town. No longer must we use the pulse of the automobile industry as a measure of our own well-being. In 1986, a student newspaper on the University of Michigan Dearborn campus offered 10 gallons of gasoline to anyone who guessed the correct amount of Devil's Night fires that year, a contest which got canceled by the canceller. I'm sorry I had to do it. Dearborn was a majority white suburb with only 85 of its 110,000 residents black. It had even designed a defeated ordinance that would restrict its parks to residents only to keep Detroit riffraff out. Some argued that the media coverage of fires and violence was sensationalist and overblown, in the same vein as the crack phenomenon and super predators of the late 80s and early 90s. A 1990 Newsweek article criticized an ABC segment on Devil's Night, saying it lapsed into gratuitous stigmatizing shorthand and downplayed the important work of local black activists and community leaders who were combating violence and arson. An 
activists and leaders were organizing. In 1985, Mayor Coleman Young established the Devil's Night Task Force, which became the Anti-Arson Initiative Steering Committee. Children under the age of 17 were not allowed out alone in the streets between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. This unidentified youngster told his dad it was the police officer's fault he stayed out. They stopped us at five minutes to six and talked to us until a minute after six, then they said, well, it's time now. You don't buy that, Dad? That no, he wasn't supposed to be out of the house. Right. He knows it. And this was the scene at the police command center tonight. Two dozen police and civilian personnel monitored a task force spread out around the city. By 1990, the number of fires had reduced greatly to 281. The destruction caused by a few on Devil's Night, the rhythm and heartbeat of a great city gets slowed down. You have to have a place to live. It's pitiful. We got to start doing something about it now. On October 30th, get mad. Help us stop Devil's Night arson. For one day, Wednesday, October 30th, for six hours, you can help stop Devil's Night fires in your neighborhood. To volunteer, call 224-3450. Get mad. Get involved. Stop Devil's Night arson. The fires were still a problem in the years that followed, peaking in 1994, the same year that a one-year-old girl named Destiny Wilson was killed in a four-story apartment building set ablaze. In response, community members rechristened the period before Halloween as Angels Night and went out on patrols. Approximately 50,000 volunteers marched the streets during this program's peak. But you know what really caused a significant drop in Devil's Night's arsons? The city raised thousands of derelict buildings in the late 80s and throughout the 90s. Less empty buildings meant less shit to burn. While the city still suffers from urban decay, more community investment and bouts of resurgence in real estate, along with an unfortunate amount of gentrification and private policing, have made violent Devil's Night a thing of the past. By 2017, Detroit would retire its Angels Night's patrols with Fire Chief Eric Jones saying, from now on, Halloween in Detroit isn't going to be about fear. It's going to be about fun. people growing up who weren't allowed to participate in Halloween because it was considered demonic, black Americans have long celebrated and enjoyed Halloween. And I think it's important to remember our ancestors in more ways than one, and showing that in between racial strife, financial woes, etc., they also, like us in the present day, found time to dress up, enjoy some spooky shit, and nosh on good treats. But it's also important to show how racial strife and financial woes impacted small cultural things like Halloween. I'm gonna go do some Halloween decorating and find something scary to watch. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you have a happy Halloween.